This is just the beginning. Welcome to our latest Axios Live, uh, coming to you from Captivity here in Alexandria, Virginia. This is going to be an awesome, awesome show. Uh, we have, I think, two of the most interesting and important CEOs in America today, uh, the head of Verizon, uh, the head of Slack. Uh, thank you uh, to Slack for making this possible. Uh, Slack is actually a, a presenting sponsor of a new area of coverage for us about the new workplace. And at the end of this program, you're going to hear from Erica Pan Andy, who's our reporter who will be covering the future of work and, and the new workplace that we're all grappling with. And if you stick around for the full hour, she's not only smart, she's self-confident. We might end with some comedy because there's no one in America who does a better make fun of me impression uh, than her. She can both like nail my Wisconsin accent and this weird gesticulation uh, that I do throughout uh, the program. Uh, thank you for following us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. My friend Dan Roth over at LinkedIn uh, emailed last night, asked if we can start carrying these shows on LinkedIn. So starting next week, uh, we'll do that. Uh, please continue to follow us uh, at hashtag Axios events, ask questions. And by the way, please keep emailing me, uh, Jim at Axios, if you have new ideas for topics we should cover or guests. A lot of the upcoming programs uh, came from you, the viewer, telling us what you're interested in, people that you would like uh, to hear from. So without further ado, we're going to talk to the founder and the CEO of Slack, Stuart Butterfield. Stuart, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good, good. I couldn't hear you at first. All right. So you okay. are the CEO and founder of Slack, which, of course, started as a video game uh, with the ironic name of Glitch. Is that true? Like, what the hell happened? Yeah. It was, well, the company was started. The, the product wasn't. But yeah. uh, back in 2009, um, a crew of us who worked at what is now Verizon, uh, but was then uh, Yahoo after Flickr was acquired, set out to build a web-based massively multiplayer game, which was not a commercial success. And um, we had developed a set of technology for internal communication that was really helpful um, and that we loved. So uh, when we decided to wind down the game, we still had a bunch of investors' money left, and we thought, well, we should try uh, putting this out as a product and um, and see if other people like it. And so we did, and they did, and now here I am. You're one of the great uh, American business success stories of our generation, uh, Slack, uh you, you talk about it starting a little bit slow and then just took off in terms of allowing people uh, to communicate in real time, to align uh, in real time. Uh, take me, I want to talk about you before we talk about Slack. Like you're now a CEO of a very uh, lucrative, very important company. How did you become a leader? Like at what point in your life you're like, you know what, I'm a leader. When did that happen? Well, I mean... Maybe high school, but in a pretty fraught and, and troubled way. Like I was always on student council until I wasn't allowed to be on, on student council anymore. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I think it, entrepreneurialism modeled um, in, my, in my family really well and it had a big influence on me. So by the time I kind of, you know, I originally going to end up a philosophy professor and um, left before finishing my, my PhD. Um, this was in 1998, so the, you know, the web was taking off and this was the early days of the first dot-com um, explosion. And um, spent a couple of years working for other people and then more or less since 2000 have been um, the, the boss of something. And you started relatively small and now you're how many people at Slack? Is it a couple thousand? Uh, around 2,100 around the world. Talk about your yeah, so leadership think, style. Like, uh, no, go continue. Yeah, I was going to say I, I've always said, and uh, I'm not sure if this is if I've made significant improvement over the years, but I always said good leader, not such a great manager. Um, and there's a, I think there's an important distinction there. There's a book uh, I'm trying to remember which one. I, I think conscious leadership, but anyway, there's a line in that book that I really liked, which was leaders remind people what's important. So it's rarely some brand new thing. I mean, the, the tactics might be new or the um, strategy might be different than the one that the organization was pursuing before. 
But the big job is to remind people what's important, remind people what the purpose is, remind people what the objectives are, remind people about roles and responsibilities. And uh, I think that's really true. You know, I think if, um, if I have a talent um, that I feel like is common with other people who are, are described as, as good leaders, it's really getting people to believe something um, that they might not have otherwise believed. Believe that something is possible. Um, believe that um, that people are capable of, of something, um, and kind of setting the bar higher. Um, I've seen that, you know, in leaders that, that I admire, and there's some that are just, uh, you know, at Bill McDermott is the you now the CEO of ServiceNow, but was previously CEO of SAP. Um, was described by our chief product officer, who's on my board, as the most optimistic person she's ever met. And, it, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not me. Uh, I'm a little bit more mm, neurotic Jew, I guess. Um, but, uh, but that enthusiasm, that belief, which is just, you know, ends up being contagious. I might have a, a slightly different style on that, but I think um, what I do that's helpful is get people to believe that we're capable of something more, we're capable of, um, of achieving something, or that something that we might not have thought as possible is actually possible. And that's the real um, you know, kind of lesson of this event, not about me and not about leadership, but I think about over the last, let's say, 25 years, since we first started talking about telecommuting, how many consultants prepared reports or how many internal strategy teams kind of you know, prepared a set of recommendations to large organizations across the country saying, this is what a, the future is going to look like. And they probably all took nine months or a year to prepare, and they probably all contemplated a period of change that lasted many, many years. Um, and if you asked anyone in January, could your 50,000-person company um, start working from home, everyone working remotely inside of a week? Everyone would have said, no, impossible. And then it turns out when you got to do it, what seemed like it was impossible is possible. And uh, what I'm hoping that people end up taking from that is that a lot of other things which seemed impossible are also possible. When you think about you and your evolution as a leader, you and I were talking yesterday and I was saying I, I sort of became a, a leader when I when I became an entrepreneur 12 years ago and I look back and I kind of cringe. I was like, I re actually wasn't that good of a leader. I, I did, didn't appreciate enough about communications or culture and I just kind of mm -hmm. hired a lot of people that were more like me. And then I learned from a lot of mistakes that I made and then also watching people who were around me who I didn't think were very good leaders and doing the opposite. When you look at your mm -hmm. life like, and you look back, like, what did you used to do that you think was effective that uh, like, why the hell was I ever thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I still, uh, I still catch myself doing that all the time, and a lot of it has to do with, um, with delivery, um, and uh, I'm not actually that big of a reader of management books, but now I'm going to mention another one um, called Crucial Conversations, and um, I always found that when there was when I had to deliver bad news, you know, it's a bad performance review or um, someone being fired or you know anything like that. Um, I would get so anxious about it. And there's a little bit of that, you know, horses can smell your fear. So, you know, by the time someone comes into the room, I'm so filled with dread um, that it, it, the um, emotional temperature is raised and, and everything um, is much more difficult than it needs to be. And one of the uh, things I learned there was stepping out of the content of the conversation, whatever it is that, that people are likely to be upset about, and um, stepping back to the overall context and, and what uh, the purpose of the conversation is, what your goals are, what their goals are, ideally anything that you have in common, um, and kind of regaining enough trust to continue the conversation. And I see people who, you know, uh, actually our chief product officer, who I already mentioned, Tamara Yehoshua, is just like a master um, at that, at, at giving um, news that people might have been upset by or might actually be upset by, but in a, in a respectful way, in a way that um, kind of brings them along as opposed to pushes them away. But I think uh, the flaws in my own leadership have often been uh, so preoccupied with whatever the goal is or, or whatever we're trying to accomplish that not taking into account how other people are going to feel about how the communication is delivered. Because and this was astonishing to me. I had a 360 review years ago now that where the, you know, the headline was, people are terrified of you. And I never thought of myself as particularly intimidating right. or scary. Um, but when you're the CEO, you just, you kind of de facto are. 
Yeah, no, uh, I think I've had that same 360 uh, at some point uh, in my career as well. You said you you read some business books. Uh, you've got a lot of people watching who are either CEOs or aspiring leaders. Like, what's the most useful book about business, about leadership that you've read? If you had to give one book to somebody, it would be what? Ooh, um, so let, I mean, less about business, more about leadership management. Um, uh, if I have to choose one, I will choose Leadership and Self-Deception. Um, and uh, it's the kind of book that if you recommend it to some one person specifically and then they read it, they'll think, you don't like them. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's one of our, our former employees gave it to me, actually a great relationship. And uh, I thought, oh, that's an interesting title, Leadership and Self-Deception. And I put it on the coffee table in the living room and then... Maybe 18 months later, I was like, oh, that is a really interesting title. And I put it on my bedside table. And then a year later, I finally read it. And I was like, oh, shit, I should have read this two and a half years ago. Um, the, if there's a point in the book that I can, like, you know, one thing that I can summarize, it's that people generally too often treat other people as either um, instruments or obstacles. Someone's in the way of something you're trying to accomplish or someone can be useful to you. And that calculus is kind of uh, pervasive. And it, in many times, um, you can't help it and there's nothing wrong with it. We're not going to all be bodhisattvas, you know, roaming the earth and uh, radiating compassion or something like that. Um, but when we fail in our own uh, moral standards, when we, when we do something that, you know, ultimately, if we thought about it, we would be ashamed of or feel regretful about, the instinct is to push that blame onto the other person. So he gives the example, which is probably familiar to many people, of it's 3 a.m. and the, uh, the new baby is crying and you wake up um, and you think, oh, God, I hope my wife or husband wakes up and takes care of that. And minutes go by and you're like, oh, man, they're so lazy. They must have woken up already. Why aren't they taking care of this? But of course, you're in, in exactly the same situation. But that mechanic exists um, in all human relationships, but is especially important, I think, for leaders, because people really, really remember um, when you care about them, when you express that, when you are respectful, um, when you treat them as a, as a whole person, even if the news is bad. Um, most people watching are probably users of Slack. Uh, we have a heavy Slack culture uh, at Axios let's assume there's people that aren't like, why would I use Slack and what would I get out of Slack? If I'm a medium size uh, company, why should I move to it quickly? Or so, you know, it's, it's a funny question because it, you know, it, six years after the, um, the public launch, you know, we're a public company now, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. We still have a hard time explaining that, um, as concisely as we would like anyway, but we now say that Slack is a channel based messaging platform and that, isn't necessarily going to be helpful for people. Um, it's messaging that they're familiar with from a, a lot of other apps and from our personal life. Um, the difference is messages go or are addressed to what we call channels instead of individuals. And you create a channel for everything that's happening across the company, for every team, every organization, every event, maybe every customer, every business unit or office location. And once you have a channel for everything, everyone knows where to go to ask their question. Everyone knows where to go to give their update. Everyone knows where to go to get caught up on something. And that's a really kind of transformative experience versus email where the uh, messages go into inboxes. Each inbox is cut off from everyone else. Um, everyone's is kind of partial and fragmented and, and unique. And it disappears when they leave the company. When they join the company, they have an empty inbox instead of, you know, when people join Slack today, people join uh, Axios, they have the whole history of, available to them. They can understand not just the content or the facts of the conversations that were happening on their team before they got there, but they can see the kind of social relationships, the expectations, how people uh, relate to one another, that kind of critical social information, which can take months to acquire when you're new on the job. Uh, ultimately, that makes it much easier for organizations to achieve a kind of alignment and the continual uh, bringing organizations back into alignment in the face of changing conditions is really the job of, of leaders and, and the job of managers. Um, ultimately, I think we're in a more and more dynamic environment. And of course, we didn't have a global pandemic in mind when we, when we first said this, but in our S1, what we talked about was in a time of increasing technological change that can cause changes in consumer behavior and what competitors are doing that can cause changes in the macroeconomic environment. 
um, where that change is, is accelerated, the fundamental challenge to any organization, not just companies, but governments, NGOs, academic institutions, the fundamental challenge is um, the creation of a kind of agility that allows them to be responsive to these changing conditions. And so that's uh, hopefully what we offer people. So that might sound that might sound really lofty, but if you think about the hours and hours and hours um, that people put into internal communication, and I don't mean strategic, interesting, creative kind of stuff. I mean like the quarterly business review, the road mapping session, the daily stand up, the status report, the update. Most meetings, you know, where people sit through a, a slide presentation is, is to get them up to speed on something. If that's 50% of your people's time, any leverage you can get on that has a disproportionate impact to more or less anything you can do. So if you can kind of increase the return on, uh, on the effort that people put into communication, um, that's incredibly powerful because the, I don't always try to find the best way to say this, but human beings are the type of animal that, you know, it's the Friday after Thanksgiving, you have a, a family together, there's eight or 10 people and someone says we should go see a movie. There's this three hour long exasperating conversation, people cycling in and out of the leadership council for this, trying to decide what mall or, or what theater to go to. And uh, ultimately you can't make it work and you don't go. Everyone has money, wanted to go to the movie theater, movie theaters are open and you just can't organize yourselves into doing it. So, and you know, as well as me, um, that to get anything accomplished, uh, it requires this incredible injection of will, painting a picture of what we're trying to accomplish, a kind of laying out the path for people, of the emotional appeal, of, of like why this is desirable, um, the kind of rational appeal and the mechanics of it, and just iterating that over and over and over again um, to bring people along towards the accomplishment of something that only a group of people can do. There's something that we've obsessed about over the last uh, four years, and really the reason we created Axios is like I just think people uh, don't put nearly enough value into simplicity, especially at this era where like our minds are clogged. We got a thousand things going on. Keep it simple. Make my life easier. How do you think mm -hmm. about that with Slack? Like my critique, uh, I love Slack. Like we use it a ton. The the, the fear mm -hmm. I have sometimes in terms of it being a part of our culture is like how do you keep it simple and efficient as opposed to next thing you know you've got a thousand channels and all these side uh, conversations. That must be something you obsess about. And I know even in your latest design, it looks like you're really thinking about like, whoa, wait, we're doing way too much. Simplify, simplify, simplify. How do you do that? Yeah, it's um, it's fascinating to me, this whole, this whole set of problems. Um, and just a very slight digression. I once tweeted um, kind of what is that? Do we have a name for the phenomenon whereby – all anyone ever wants out of a restaurant website is the address, the phone number, the menu, the opening hours, like one of those four things. But what you get when you go there is the slow fading of an image with a kind of a Ken Burns effect and autoplay music. And after this uh, multimedia experience, you know, if they have the phone number, it's an image, you can't even tap on it and call them. Um, how can they all be like this if no one wants that? And someone suggested the, the term owner's delusion and the owner's delusion I thought was a brilliant, perfect name. Uh, it's, we think our thing is, is so important and, and so special that we don't recognize it. And I think that's how the complexity creeps in. And there is almost like a Zen mind trick of trying to pull yourself out of that to see things the way other people do. And, and this is, uh, I mean, you know, that uh, I've tried to express uh, over and over and over again uh, inside the company because I think it's, it's such an important concept and so difficult to keep in mind is people don't care about Slack the way that we do. They, it's just not important to them. They, you know, if you're a committed user and you spend a lot of time on it, you might have feedback. They might like something or not like something. But for the overwhelming majority of who come to our website, if this is the threshold they have to hit of intent to, to visit the website, this is where they are. There's no excess intent. They have concerns about how things are going with their spouse or their kids messing up in school or they got to respond to some email and they're worried about their health and there's something where they want to watch on Netflix. And we're just like not in the top thousand uh, priorities in their life. Um, the response to that that is most effective is making it simple, to make it comprehensible, to make it, um, uh, you know, drive people to a kind of action that, that they uh, can understand, that they uh 
you know, it gives them kind of sufficient desire to accomplish something that they're willing to push through some, some friction. And so for existing users of Slack, it's a really difficult challenge because our biggest customers, uh, you know, IBM's the single biggest 350,000 daily active users, millions of channels, tens of thousands of workspaces. And the other hand, we have, you know, teams of five people using Slack. It's a radically different kind of uh, experience and one user interface that we've kind of got to make flexible enough to accommodate that. The second thing I would say is, um, we have a responsibility beyond the, the design of the software, the, the user interface and um, the functionality, to also um, give people some guidance on the modes of, of communication or the practices, the etiquette, the habits um, that will be most effective in this environment. Because a lot of people are coming in with 25 years of experience using email. And uh, those are very deep habits, very deep ways of interpreting the significance of different things they see that don't translate necessarily. So um, we've got to give them a lot of support there as well. When you think about this moment uh, for the country and it, with technology broader, broadly, the big technology companies, one of the fears I have is that like the big just keep getting bigger and it makes it harder for other competitors, largely because the big companies can buy you up or they can try to muscle you out. Uh, in many ways, it's sort of now Slack versus Microsoft. Uh, I know there's other players, but it's fundamentally Slack versus Microsoft in this space. How tempted were you early on when the Googles or Microsofts came to you and wanted to buy you? You, you own a nice chunk of the company. Your company's worth billions of dollars. Was there ever a point that's like, eh, that's, that's kind of sweet. I think I'm going to do that. Or was it never, ever a possibility? No, because I think, I mean, I guess there's two reasons. One is the... The economic outcome is going to be good no matter what and, and better than I, I need it to be. So uh, it's nice to have more money to give away at the, at the end of the day, I guess. But that's not a, as motivating as um, seeing if you can accomplish something. I mean, I look at this and um, try to encourage uh, employees to look at it this way. Is I feel like you know someone who got to play in the Berlin Philharmonic or uh, on the national football team of Brazil or, you know, something like that. Like it, it's an opportunity to play on the, on the biggest stage, the, um, um, a great game and, it, and it's exciting. So why would I give that up? Uh, I also think that we have a much, there's an information asymmetry. We have a much clearer idea of what the possibilities are than anyone else. Um, and that, you know, I don't think anyone would uh, either price that in or kind of uh, believe in it in the same way that we do. And um, we've been, right or more right, uh, you know, kind of we've exceeded those kind of beliefs on the upside year after year after year, kind of proving um, ourselves wrong in a sense with thinking about how big this can be. And if you have the opportunity to do that, I think it's uh, it's very exciting and hard to say no to. You, uh, part of your job in leading is sort of getting people to believe in things they might not believe in and be able to see things that they might not see today. Help the viewers see the world through your eyes three years from now, if you're working at a company or you're running a company and you have a presence beyond just one small local community, so you have some uh, some remote aspects to you, you certainly have some connectivity uh, to others outside of just your, your one location, what does work look like? That's a great question. And I mean, so this is maybe a little bit aspirational, but I think it's also an extrapolation of what we've seen since like... Um, 1979 or so when VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet was released. And that's the increased use of software, the proliferation of business software product categories, the increase in uh, spend that companies uh, have in, in software on a per employee per year basis. No matter how you look at it, we're using more and more software. And generally, um, that's automating away certain things that humans used to do. And of course, you automate away the things that are most amenable to automation, which tend to be the most repetitive, kind of mind-numbing things. The things that uh, that computers are great at, or and that humans are kind of lousy at, like sort of remembering stuff and doing arithmetic really quickly. Uh, as we kind of get better and better with software, and we're able to automate away more and more of that stuff, it means that the work that remains is more demanding of people's intelligence and creativity. You know, those things that, that, that only humans have. And if you think about that, that means the work is more challenging, hopefully also more rewarding. It's more challenging to perform. It's more challenging to manage. You know, if you're managing um, a group of workers at a chair factory and you know, someone's job is to screw the, 
the leg into the base of the chair. You can tell how, how effective they are at their job relative to other people. But as you know, like come evaluate the performance of my marketing organization, my software engineers. It's really, it's very difficult to, to understand how well someone's performing because the work is so, so complex and so uh, so demanding, uh, again, of that intelligence and creativity. So I think that's the, the thing that will be really interesting to see over the next three years, five years, 10 years, is how that plays out, you know, how people's skills uh, evolve, evolve and, and adopt. Because one thing we haven't seen is a reduction in the number of people required to achieve some kind of business outcome. One of the things I worry about uh, beyond like uh, economic inequality is sort of like information or uh, technology inequality. That basically, if you're really fluent in these technologies, if you understand where to get uh, really high quality information, you just have such a decisive advantage uh, over people that don't. How much does that worry you? And like, wh like, where do you see your role in terms of like helping? Man, yeah, maybe narrow that gap a little bit. That's a great question. I mean, so hope that's it's a great ambition, and and hopefully is one of the results of people using Slack, but. Not just Slack. The um, we often say to customers, you're not going to provision Slack for your end users inside of your enterprise company, and then all your problems are solved. But it is an effective tool or instrument for you to drive the kind of change um, that you would like to see. So hopefully, you know, there's some some part of that. <laughs> you had a background. Um, there's some part of that which is, which is really uh, helpful for people in achieving that kind of. Um, information advantage or that degree of coordination or alignment, which allows them to, to achieve that. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. The, the existing economic inequality can be definitely exacerbated by a differential in, um, in either like adeptness with technology or investment or access to technology. And I think that's, we're seeing uh, an example of that play out in a pretty uh, dystopian, almost nightmarish way right now with um the massive increase in, in differences in educational outcomes for students over the course of this year, you know, people who have access to, to technology, computers, accessible uh, internet, and, and all of that, and people who don't. You know, so already, probably, that's caused by some economic inequality. And now we're going to push the, the results even further apart. So uh, it, it is worrying. And um, you know, if I have a hope uh, for the you know, the result uh, or the outcomes that we are able to achieve out of this global crisis, it's that we can reevaluate some of the decisions that we've made along the way. You know, like one of them is employer mandated healthcare. It maybe is a terrible idea if 30 million people lose their jobs right when a health crisis hits. Uh, or that maybe we do need a social safety net in this country um, that allows people to kind of overcome that. Because times like this, Ideally, people can question, you know, what, do they, what do they really want? Well, what, what kind of life do they want? Um, certainly, people are forced to kind of reevaluate a lot of assumptions that they, they had anyway. Um, and maybe this is uh, wishful thinking, but I, I do hope that we kind of collectively um, see that we're all together. I mean, you got Republicans who thought we should just send checks to people every month, which, by the way, I think is great not what any of them would have said three months prior. So if we have that opportunity right. to change, we should we should take it. Uh, we'll end on a more upbeat, uh, fun note. Uh, at one point, Robert De Niro cursed you out on stage. What the hell did you do to Bobby De Niro? I, so I think he just <laughs> didn't hear or something like that, but it was a Wall Street Journal Innovators Award. And, and uh, um I got up to accept mine for, for technology and, I, and, you know, I was sitting behind um, Anna Wintour and Luchi Prada and there was supermodels and then he's on the other table with Angelina Jolie who's going to introduce him and Brad Pitt. And I said something like, Phew, well, you know, thanks for the award. I'm sure I'm not going to keep this short because I don't think anyone wants to hear from a nerd when there's all these you know, movie stars and, uh, and fashion models here. Uh, let's see. Bobby De Niro right there. And I just on the plane over here watched Godfather 2 for, for the uh, second time and Something like that. And I don't know what he got out of that, but he just came up and was like, I don't know who the fuck you think you are. But, excuse me. Um, and, uh, I don't know. <laughs>
Uh, good story. Uh, great conversation. Uh, thank you so much. It's so illuminating. Uh, very helpful, I think, to everybody that's watching. You have an amazing lens uh, into the world. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being also a partner on our new uh, workforce coverage. Uh, Stuart Butterfield, thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, up next, we have another CEO of an even larger uh, company, also sitting in the communication space. Uh, Hans Vesberg is both the CEO of Verizon and the chairman. Hans, uh, welcome to Axios Live. Hi. Great to be here. How are we doing? Uh, so I understand that uh, you run a massive company, right? You have how many? Like 110,000 employees? 135,000. 135,000. So you, uh, your time is precious. And I understand that you obsess about how you allocate uh, your time. Walk us through like how you do that, why you do that, and how it makes you a more efficient and effective leader. Yes, I think he, historically, um, when I think about leadership, I always thought that that is a profession. I probably have been a leader for the last 25 years and I've always tried to be better and better. And I made a model for some 10 years ago where I basically said, first of all, you need to lead yourself. You need to know yourself. You're going to be a leader. Secondly, how do you lead the people around you? And the third one is uh, then is uh, leading uh, from the front with the most important and strategic things. And in the last area there, when when you should spend the time on the right things, I decided when I became CEO, uh, 2009 for at Ericsson that uh, I I need to force myself to work with the right thing. So I started to measure every hour I work and I do a forecast in advance where I want to spend my time for a quarter and then I see that I spend the time on it. Uh, I was uh, very worried at that moment, for example, that I would spend all my time on governance and just following up the other people because that was my previous job at Ericsson. I was a CFO. Uh, so I just said, said that I need to force myself to be up with customers. I need to do things that is really my type of uh, uh, of impact and where I have the most value. And I think since then, or since then, I measured every hour I work. I slot them in and I do forecast in advance. So I really see that I spend the, the time on the right things where I make the most value. I think one of the, as I get older, I think the thing I've gotten much better at is that is like being much better at managing time. I think effective leaders are really good at it. Uh, give me an idea. Give like the viewers. You have a lot of uh, CEOs or small business owners or aspiring leaders watching. Like, what is a hack or two that you use to save time? Do you like set a firm time limit on the the length of a meeting, or you'll never have a conversation longer than X? All right, give give us a couple of tricks. So the, the tricks, uh, I don't have so many tricks of how long the meetings are. It, it's more about the areas I will spend. So let's assume that for a quarter I decide I'm going to spend 30% of my time with customers. Then the most important is that actually I really do it and I have meetings with customers. Or it could be a quarter where we have a challenge and I want need to reach out more to my investors. I want to talk to more of my shareholders. Then I allocate time to that. That sort of I, have I done it. Then internal meetings... I always work a lot with agendas and governance, and sometimes it uh, sounds very bureaucratic, but to be honest, if you're one year ahead, know all your internal meetings exactly when they're coming, and you put them in the right series in order for not to have inefficiencies, I do that. I mean, so usually in the October timeframe, we put out all the governance, internal governance for the whole 2020, so we know all the meetings, so people can plan. I think planning and governance is really making efficiency for, for an organization because there are so many people relying on the hierarchy on the, on the size company like Verizon. So if I start moving around meetings, I can crush hundreds of thousands of people's uh, agendas, uh, which might have much more important meetings than for just uh, moving around for me. So that's why the governance and structure for me is something extremely important. Is it true that during the crisis and maybe even beyond the crisis that you meet every day for one hour with anybody from Verizon who wants to call in? Yes, I have a live webcast at noon. I'm in I'm at the end of my seventh week where at noon uh, we actually invite all our employees 
to listen in because this is uh, times of uncertainty and this is when leaders need to be there. So we talk about everything happening in the company, reassure them, talk about uh, all our new uh, principles and policies that we need to implement. Uh, we have viewership between some um, 30,000 to 60, 70,000 every day during noon. Uh, so as long as I have that many viewers, it's important for us to continue. We also do it in external channels. So uh, nowadays we have uh, shareholders and the media asking questions. Uh, I'm fine with that as well because we're not hiding anything. We, we want to be as transparent as possible, both with the challenges, but also with the opportunity how we deal with this corona uh, virus and the epidemic or pandemic we have. That might strike people as a lot of time allocated to sort of communicating uh, with staff. You've clearly made the calculation that that, that hour is best allocated uh, both on sort of alignment and reassurance. What, is it more in this environment about reassurance or more about alignment? Because people are nervous, obviously. Even if you have a good job at a company that's growing at this time, people still feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get laid off or I know someone who's getting laid off. Is it more about reassurance for you? Uh, it's, it's more about reassurance and that you can ask any question you want to the leadership. And to be honest, we don't have all the answers. But uh, clearly, we want to be transparent. It's not much preparation for me. I basically talk about what we have done the last 24 hours. Uh, it's about uh, the policies we're implementing that we already have discussed the same day. Because every morning, I have one hour which I dedicate to the crisis, but no more time. Uh, and, and that is uh, sort of forming also how I speak to my employees. It's total transparency. What have you learned about, uh, even pre-coronavirus, uh, like what have you learned about leadership? Like what are the things when you look back that you kind of cringe or wonder like, why did I do it that way now that I see the, the beauty or brilliance of how I can do it now? Like I think people uh, who are trying now to become managers or leaders really benefit from that type of, of perspective. What, where did you make mistakes that you don't make the same mistake now? I think what I learned uh, was basically when I, when I realized that being a leader is a profession. You can be an expert in accounting, um, an engineer that is designing things. You need to fortify yourself all the time. You can be an excellent marketeer. In all those professions, you're improving yourself every day. You want to learn more. I think that too many people are actually taking the leadership role for granted. It's a good way for maybe having a higher uh, compensation or something like that. But you should spend equally much time on developing yourself as a leader. And I think that I realized pretty early on in my career, and that's why I started to measure myself. I, I measure myself every day, for example, in order to see how I, how I act as a leader, because ultimately my job is to inspire, give energy to others, especially in a large organization. And if, if I'm not that inspiring and energized myself, I cannot give it away. So... All in all, I, I think that realization has also built up the models I use in order to continue to develop and actually improve my leadership every day. Walk us through a little bit of that regimen. That's interesting to think about while leadership is, is, is like being an accountant. Like you have to keep, keep working at it and thinking about it. Uh, you're an athlete. You like to, to work out. Like what is your regimen? Like what are the things that you do on a daily or weekly basis that you think help lift your game as a leader? Are there things that you read, things that you listen to, things that you watch, people you talk to that you think are better leaders than you that you are trying to learn from? I'd love to hear a couple of those. So, so I think that uh, historically, you know, when you start with leadership, you need to start with yourself. What are your strengths and weaknesses? And when you have sorted that out, uh, and of course a leader like me, I have a lot of weaknesses and areas where I'm, I'm not super good. I have a couple of others that are probably okay and a little bit more than that. So for me, if you start with that, then you can also do, build your playbook, how you're going to work with it. Of course, then the first thing comes out from that is what type of people do you recruit if you have weakness in certain areas? And then the diversity becomes an enormously important model for me. Uh, I'm born in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, I, I'm very different from many other people. I'm diverse from that point of view. But I need people that are from other cultures, other backgrounds, other educations. I'm an accountant. So all for me is about that. That's where it starts. And uh, that's why I also realized that one of my strengths is actually to lead people, energize people. But as any normal person, uh, you have days where you feel better or worse. And that's why I start, started some 15 years ago to grade every day. Uh, the day after I grade where I, uh, where I am at a scale of 0 to 10. 
Because if I'm at two or three, I'm not really realizing uh, for my organization the things that I'm good at, meaning inspire, motivate them. Uh, if I'm on seven and eight, I probably am in my sweet spot. If I'm on 10, I have too much energy, so people get tired. So that's how I work with the models in order to improve myself. Then when it comes to uh, maybe more theoretical leadership, and uh, etc., I haven't read many books, to be honest. Uh, but I had the chance to meet all world leaders that you can ever imagine on a frequent basis. And I take pieces from all of them. And usually when I meet other CEOs that uh, you read about and see, I always ask questions that might not be about business. Of how did you manage your agenda? How do you train? How do you keep in physics? Because I learn from all of them. And that's the subset of things that I bring to my inspiration, how I improve. Who are two or three leaders out there, either in business, sports, politics, whatever, who you really look up to that you're like, ah, they're really on the, they've got moves that I, I aspire to have? I don't really have any any particular one. I have pieces of, of, of people, uh, of leaders that I bring together. Um, I work a lot in, I come from sports, so I have a lot of uh, role models from sports where I have learned from during my uh, semi-professional career in sports. I worked a lot in, with the UN uh, and with uh, uh, social impact, etc. I learned a lot from those people that don't, doesn't have the power that uh, leaders like CEOs like me have, where you can just decide sometimes, learn from them how they empower by communication. And then, of course, uh, in any leadership and any person, your background and history is important. And my father was probably one of the most important people in my life. He shaped me as a leader and as a person uh, from basically I, I was five years old when I became my coach in my sport that I was doing until I was 22. I was together with him basically every day during those 17 years. And there's no one that has impacted me so much about values, how you lead people, how you are a team member and all of that. So those are the different uh, aspects of inputs I got during my career. Most people are familiar, probably everybody watching this is familiar with uh, Verizon. Probably a lot of people are, are, are able to watch this or, or be part of this conversation because of Verizon. In your own words, explain what Verizon does. Like to, to somebody, like if someone didn't understand Verizon, what do you do? We are a network uh, as a service. We have um, a big network which has everything from wireless, wireline, 4G, 5G broadband. And on top of that, we have different type of applications for different customer groups. That's what we do. We are connecting people all, all around the globe and especially here in the US. That's what we're doing. We spend some 17 to 18 billion US dollars every year investing in our network in order to have the best network in the world. And we feel that we always have been on the forefront and that we want to continue to do. Our model is very much based on partnership. So if you think about, um, we have a big partnership on 5G Mobile Edge Compute with Amazon. We have a partnership with Apple on Apple Music, which is uh, exclusive. We have a partnership with Disney, which is uh, Disney Plus, which is exclusive. So we use uh, the three assets we have. It's the network, which is the best network. It's the distribution. We're touching more consumers than anybody else in this country and big, big enterprises and small and medium businesses and, uh, and Internet customers. And ultimately, it's our brand. That's how we build our strategy, and that's how we combine with others in order to create more value for our customers. I think it was this morning I was reading, uh, the, the, I think it was the Attorney General in New York was uh, writing to you, writing to other uh, pay TV providers, saying that you should either reduce or, or uh, I guess, basically reduce people's uh, cable bills because a lot of them were paying for live sports and there aren't any sports uh, to watch. Uh, one, is that something that you would do? Uh, and then two, if it's not something you would do, would you ask the networks who charge you more because they had those sports rights that they no longer have, maybe to take a reduction so you can pass it on to the consumer? So I'll tell you what we're doing, because um, we already, uh, I think the first week of this pandemic, we decided to keep uh, America connected. That means that any residential customer or small and medium uh, business that have problems uh, to pay uh, or other technology problems in the COVID-19 uh, for, for due to COVID-19. We are not disconnecting them. 
we're, we're not charging them late fees or anything. So that's what we have done. And then we will continue to do that. We have extended that to the end of this uh, quarter, uh, 30th of June. And that's how we manage the customers that really cannot afford this at the moment. Uh, including in that is, of course, if you have Fios, <laughs> which is our broadband service. But on the second question you have, I think it's a good question to ask because, I mean, ultimately, I'm not uh, owning the, the content rights nor the sports rights, uh, uh, and I'm not the one charging for it. They, that's actually a, a pass through to us. We are talking to them all the time, uh, but that has what we have done instead. We have given away free content to our customers on top of what we have today. But we also give them all the mix and match opportunities to reduce their uh, reduce their uh, sort of channels or uh, whatever they, they want to change to in these times. So we are much more liberal, and I think that in times like this. There's no playbook. You just need to think about your four stakeholders in every t decision you take. Because the, and the four stakeholders are customers, shareholders, employees, and society. And take the long-term decision on them, even though right now it can hurt short-term. And that's what we have done with the, or keep uh, America connected. Uh, everyone hears the term 5G. Uh, I often think people don't understand what it means and what it'll unleash. Uh, in the simplest of terms, for those people that aren't super fluent in it, what is 5G and why should they care? Like, how will it meaningfully change their life? So 5G is um, dramatically different than any previous uh, wireless technology. 2D to 4G basically had two capabilities, throughput and speed. And uh, that's why we, we carried around the 2G phone and you can only call in it. Today with the 4G phone, you can stream any type of service, at least if you're on the Verizon phone. That's the evolution of, uh, of 4G. Very much focused on consumers, to be honest. 5G is actually designed from the beginning uh, for uh, enterprises and for society or for industries and society. And it has eight capabilities, not only enormous throughput and speed, which are 10x what you have today, but it has low latency down to 10 milliseconds, which basically means that from a wireless phone, you can have the, the same sort of latency to the internet as you would have from a fixed network. Um, it has a battery lifetime. It has uh, how many connected devices you can have at the same time. So I'll give you an example so you understand. In 4G today, we can connect up to 50 to 70 or oh, 75,000 de devices per square kilometers. That's the limitation of 4G. In, in 5G is 1 million. There's never going to be 1 million people on one square kilometer. So all this is designed for actually industrial usage equally much. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, benefits for consumers as well with the low latency, AR, VR, etc. is coming, uh, etc. So, that's why we have three business cases, and I will take them quickly. One is, of course, the mobility and for consumers having a 5G phone. Another is 5G mobile edge compute, which is basically bringing all the cloud services to the edge in order to actually do totally new things at the edge of the network. And uh, then the third one is the 5G home, where instead of having a fiber or any cable to the home to have a broadband, you can have 5G to the home. That's the three use cases we have right now, and we are deploying together with our partners. When you think about this moment, running a company uh, with the coronavirus, uh, uh, just such a, a massive part of everybody's life, and, and then therefore part of everybody's business, what do you know now that you didn't know at the beginning of this virus uh, that uh, has made a meaningful difference in how you run the company? I assume it's a lot different, right? Most of your people are at home. Like, Walk me through that. So we just the stats, uh, we have roughly 115 to 120,000 people working from home. But I also need to say that I have a lot of my, my, my really good engineers out in the field to keep all these networks out. And I have 30% of my stores open because it's, it's so important uh, to keep it up in this country. I mean, it, I think it is the second most important infrastructure in our country right now. Of course, the, the healthcare system is number one. But... The next one is the technology, that the networks keeps up, and I have a lot of people out there. So what I've learned from it is, of course, that as any company, we can run this company virtually. Uh, we pivoted in two weeks to have 115,000 people work from home. 
Uh, today I'm more eff effective than uh, before because uh, with the way you need to deal and do meetings, you're more effective than uh, actually having uh, physical meetings. Do I think that's the long-term solution? No. But do I think it's going to be a new normal where we're going to have a much different workplace? Yes, definitely. I think we're going to see uh, clearly a change of how we behave in office environment and how we're going to interact. Uh, which I think is good because it's just going to increase the productivity and also giving the employees a better uh, life and, and uh, sort of a balance in life. Uh, then there's a couple of other things that I think is important that I think we have broken down a couple of things in our society that has taken too long. I have always said that broadband or mobility broadband and cloud are the 21st century's infrastructure. And we have seen it already 10 years ago that we can do remote healthcare, we can do education remotely. That will now start to happen because we have broken that down. And I'm not only talking about the United States right now, because I talk about the rest of the world. Because ultimately, one of the biggest inequalities we have in this world is access to information, healthcare, uh, education, etc. The only way to bridge that sustainable is to use mobility, broadband, and cloud. And I think that now everyone involved sees that can happen and it can actually work. And I, I'm actually a little bit positive because of that, because suddenly I think we can get a much more equal planet and it doesn't really matter where you're born or where you come from. We have ways to go, but clearly we have learned now that this is possible. We can do it. In your mind, by the end of this calendar year, will most of those employees be back working in a physical space? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, uh, ultimately, we're going to have a staggered uh, way of coming back to work. We haven't really decided exactly how to do it, but uh, we are working on it. But you also need to understand, it's an employee choice as well. Ultimately, we need to think that they, they also need to decide that they feel good about coming back. We as an employer will do everything to see that we are making the comfort and uh, safe and healthy for our employees to come back to the office. But ultimately, it's the employees. I don't think we we're going to see a, a new a sort of a normal situation by year end, no. And I think in 2021, we're going to see a new normal, how we're going to operate as a, the, future, the future enterprise, because it's going to be a new type of enterprise set up in the future, for sure. You have amazing access uh, to, to people, amazing access to data. On the people part, and then I have a data question. On the people uh, part, how scared should people that are watching this be about the economy? You see so many of the indicators, and because you have so many consumer products, but also business products, you have a lot of uh, early indicators. How worried should people be? I think that we, we had our earnings call last week, so we went over it. So we're, of course, seeing quite staggering numbers when it comes to consumers not being able to pay their bills, etc., um, and uh, and uh, then you we have seen a sort of a rebound when the checks from the governments are come and all of that. But I think the, the magnitude uh, or, or the impact ultimately for, for this uh, economy is going to be how long this is going to continue. Uh, and, and it's a hard balance. It's the same balance I have every day. That's been safe and health of our employees is number one. And number two is keeping up the networks. For, for a country, any country in the world, is a safe or healthy of the citizens and then versus the economical development in the country and how deep uh, the impact will be. I don't think we know that yet, but the longer it goes, the tougher it's going to be. That's the only thing we know. Uh, and we need to get together because this is not one unit being able to solve it, meaning corporations or governments or civil society or individual uh, uh, citizens. It, it, it's a new way to work. Uh, I talk to so many more CEOs. I, I always talk to our customers. Nowadays, I'm, I'm on round tables two times a day talking to other CEOs, to governments, in order to share what we're doing, in order to be better. It's a, it's a crisis that doesn't have a playbook. That's never happened in the lifetime of the people running countries and, and companies uh, in, in our experience. There has been bank crisis, been telecom crisis, but it's never been a health crisis, which is totally different. So you need to rethink your playbook when you're doing this. And that's why it's so important to talk to others and get uh, imp input from others and share. Uh, on the data side, um, what are you seeing in terms of like Internet usage or, or habits on cell phones? 
that's different? Like, how are we behaving as a species differently during this crisis? Like, when are we using more capacity? When are we using less capacity? What are you seeing? Three patterns. Number one, if you, if you compare from the before this pandemic broke out, I mean, we have 150% growth of gaming in the network. We have 1,200% growth of collaboration tools like uh, video conferencing, uh, chat functions and all of that. We have uh, some 50% up on streaming, 40% up on uh, downloads. Everything has just gone up dramatically how you use the network. That's the first uh, you're seeing. 800 million calls a day, which is twice the amount we would have on the Mother's Day, which is our peak day of year. That means we have peak day every day right now. So that's what we've seen since the beginning. If we now start looking at week to week, it start to fade. Very little growth between week to week right now. We have actually declined on gaming. Uh, we have declined on um, streaming. Uh, the only thing that is really growing week to week is the collaboration tools. That's still growing. And that's from 1,200% uh, uh, growth from the beginning. So that's, what, that's the two uh, things I see. And the third one we see is, of course, the mobile handoffs. That's when people move between two uh, different uh, uh, radio cells. Um, if, we, if we now compare that before the pandemic, we're down roughly 35%. People are moving 35% less in the country. But then if you start digging into that, it's very different. Upstate New York, down 60%, meaning people are really staying home. Uh, and then you have uh, states like uh, Tennessee and Carolinas, where basically is equal as before the pandemic, meaning they are moving equally much as before. That's the three things we see in the network right now. But the most important, the network is good. It's, it's handling all the traffic. We have very little congestion. We, we're actually performing better than normal. Uh, Hans Vesberg, you obsess about your time, so I'll be respectful of your time. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. And stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have Erica Pandy, who is soon to be launching a new newsletter for us at Axios called At Work that's looking at the topics we just talked about with Verizon uh, and, and Slack in terms of what does the future of work uh, look like. Erica, how are you? Good. How are you, Jim? Nice to see you. Explain your, explain your new beat uh, to people that are watching and why they should subscribe to your newsletter. So this beat started off as a reaction to what we're seeing around us now. Um, you know, one of the things that's bothering me about covering work has been people talk about the future of work when the future of work is really already here. And we're seeing that more than ever now with this pandemic. Overnight, as both CEOs said, America sent everyone home. And we went through this rapid period of change, and that's going to last. And so, and so we need a product. Uh, Axios needs a product that sort of looks at what's changing all around us, why, and how CEOs and workers can navigate that. When you look at the incoming questions we got for the show, what is the biggest theme? What are people most curious about in your space? People are curious how much of this is going to be a new normal. And I think that is that was top of mind for both these CEOs that talked today. What I found really interesting in your conversations is they both said that we're in this period of where companies are, you know, that resistance to change is super low right now. Companies are super nimble because they've been forced to be. And so, you know, remote work has been a buzzword for a really long time, but before the pandemic, only about 4% of Americans were working remote full time. And now if you're looking at the top 20% of earners, which is most, you know, white collar office jobs, that's closer to 80% uh, per a new Brookings report. So, a lot of this is going to be difficult for, for uh, workers who are parents or taking care of relatives at home. But for some people, this is going to be a welcome change and they're going to want, it's going to be pretty sticky when this is all over and people are going to go to their managers and say, you know, I really liked that. Can we keep doing that more? And do you get the sense from talking to, uh, to the different businesses that people feel like now that we've settled in somewhat to a more remote reality, do people feel like they're as efficient or more efficient? Do they feel like they're as aligned or more aligned? Or do they feel like unnerved and unsteady? I think there's a big difference, uh, as, as you know, has been talked about by a lot of smart leaders on this, is that there's a difference between working at home 
and working at home during a pandemic. And there's a lot of fear. People are worried about their health. They're worried about the health of their loved ones. So you're going to see productivity take a hit. But, you know, longer term, when this becomes a routine that people choose, there's a lot of benefits to working from home. You can pick your own schedule. Folks can give time to family. They can move out of big cities. You might see some of the urbanization that we've seen over the past 50 years start to disperse. And, and you do see some stories of folks saying, I'm, I'm eating dinner with my family more and I'm liking that. I'm finding more time to work out and that's making me more productive at the office. Or, or just I'm, I'm out, you know, I'm outside of New York City finally and, and that's bringing me peace of mind. So, you know, both things are happening. How do you personally feel about it? Like we, uh, as you know, we're 200 people. We communicate uh, a lot. We, we, we talk about the, how, how much our company itself has evolved uh, to basically be a dispersed and, and remote culture. How are you holding up? Like, how, like what, what life hacks have you learned that are working for you? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm one of the lucky ones in that I, you know, I'm a, I'm a single person. I don't have kids to take care of, kids that I suddenly have to homeschool. So, my life isn't, isn't all that different. I think I've learned, uh, our, our HR department has been so, so helpful. I've learned that getting up and acting as if you're getting ready to work, sometimes I'll even go outside and take a 15 minute walk around the block to commute. Uh, all that stuff helps because, uh, you know, just the, the, the hardest thing for most people has been the blurred lines between what is time off and what is time on. So delineating those, I think, has been the biggest hack for me. I want to uh, end by thanking uh, Slack for making this possible. I promised comedy at the end. I've told people you're fearless. I told them your self-confidence. And I told them that you do maybe the best impression of me ever. Have at it. All right. Okay. Here's, here's my Jim Vanda High. People ask us what's important, what's worth covering. And, you know, it's not the politics. It's not the D.C. noise. That's part of it. But it's the collision of technology and business and the health crises around us. And Stuart Butterfield, I mean, you're at the center of this. Tell us, where are you seated? <laughs> you're really good at that. You keep perfecting it. And it just shows like the humility that I have that I allow you to continue to make fun of me. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, please continue uh, to tune in to Axios.com for coverage and comedy. And email me at Jim at Axios if you have any ideas for future shows, any feedback on how we can better serve you. Thank you. Stay healthy and stay safe.